Well, good morning. It's great to be able to get around the Word of God once more. We're going to be looking again at the letter to the Ephesians by the Apostle Paul. So I'm going to read to you starting at verse 3, and we're going to simply read down to the end of verse 8. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. This is the word of the Lord. All righty then. Well, let's get into the letter that Paul writes to the Ephesians. And we're going to be concentrating mainly today on a concept of which I would like to call grace and justice. Not as in opposition to each other. God's grace and God's justice or God's holiness and God's love are not on some ends of a spectrum or polar opposites to each other, but rather they are one and the same thing, just different expressions of the one and the same thing, that God's holiness is loving and God's love is holy. God isn't just flippant in his love and just says, I just love you as all, and nor is he severe in his holiness um, and somehow divorced from love. No, God does everything he does is loving but uh, God's love is a worthy love. It is a holy love. It is a, it is a profound love. And uh, so when we're talking about forgiveness and redemption, as Paul does here, um, we have to see it in the context of its cost in the blood of Christ. And so when we see the blood of Christ, we begin to fully appreciate the nature of God's grace. And certainly we must never play uh, grace and justice off against one another. So, so what Paul is putting here for, sorry, what Paul is putting forward here is grace in the sense that it transforms and that it has a profound power. And, and, and when we understand the cost of that grace, then we understand the nature of the grace in a whole new way. Now, you notice that Paul writes that we have been given forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And I like that word lavish because here it is a super superlative uh, verb which can be translated as superabundance or excessive over indulgence. You know, I remember once I was uh, out bird watching on a country road. Uh, out in the uh, mid-north of South Australia and a guy pulled up next to me in an old paddock basher and the top had been sawn off of this car and in the back seat of the car it was just full of weapons, guns, shotguns, uh, pistols, um, uh, rifles, all sorts of things and when he found out I was bird watching he said I can help you with bird watching and then he proceeded to pull out one of his high-powered rifles and he aimed it and shot a hapless pigeon and that pigeon was dead. And when I say dead, I don't just mean that the pigeon fell down to the ground dead because there was no trace of that pigeon to be found uh, after that. The pigeon was there one second and the next, it vanished. It was completely obliterated. And that's the kind of over excessive, uh, over abundance of God's grace that he's poured out on our sin. He hasn't just forgiven us of our sins. He has obliterated it and he has wiped it out. And so that's, that's the kind of nature that Paul is attaching to the grace of God, saying that God has given us a super abundance of his grace. He has lavished upon us. He has not been conservative in any way whatsoever, but he has given us an abundance of it. But when we talk about grace, we must not talk about it merely as, as if God is just saying, oh, you know, what's a sin between friends? You know, what's, what's a genocide between friends? I just forgive you. Now, God's forgiveness is not cheap. Grace is not cheap. Grace is extremely expensive and it costs something. And that's why Paul counterbalances this understanding that we've been redeemed and we've been forgiven the lavishness of God's uh, 
uh, of God's grace is counterbalanced by the cost of it, which in verse 7 is the blood of Christ, which of course represents the death of Christ, the life of Christ and the death of Christ all tied up in one. So it's in him, in, in Christ and in his life and his death, that we have redemption from our sins in the blood of Christ. So, so we sometimes we, as Westerners, though, we have a problem with this whole concept of blood, particularly when you look at the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament cult of worship, and then you look at the, the, um, the sacrifice of Jesus. I've often heard people say things like, uh, you know, why is God so bloodthirsty? Or, or, or why was it necessary that Jesus had to die such an appalling, such a horrendous death? And the short, simple answer to that question, I believe, is that the dilemma of human sin is so profound and so appalling that it requires a severe and terrible remedy. And, and, and so our sensibilities as gentle Westerners who are shielded from blood is that these kind of rituals seem so strange to us. You know, bloody sacrifice seems so unseemly and so archaic. However, the truth is that we live in a bloody world. We can't avoid that. We live in a bloody world. And because we live in a bloody world, it takes a bloody sacrifice in order to um, render our sin and our corruption voided. It's, so it, this is not a cheap thing. This is not an easy thing. This, it requires blood for blood. It's fighting fire with fire, if you like. You know, just the other night, I was reminded when uh, Graham Slater was uh, presenting his, um, his uh, insights into the First World War, just what a horrendous affair that was. Thousands of men dying in one day, being you know, pointlessly um, shot by machine gun fire, that sort of thing. And the, and, the, and the thousands of bodies that were never recovered that have just been churned up in the mud of war. And... And, and what's interesting is that the First World War came right at the end of a period of human history now known as the Romantic Era. And the Romantic Era, if you like, is the era in which human beings fell in love with themselves uh, because of all of the accomplishments and the progress they had made through the Enlightenment. It was almost as if the Enlightenment had dawned a brave new age of humanity, being able to solve all its own problems and who needs God anymore? We've, we've become gods for ourselves. And so um, human beings or humanity fell in love with themselves and began this whole romantic era. And then it was like the romantic era was, was slammed shut when the First World War showed that really, despite all of their scientific progress, that we really hadn't changed as human beings. We were still out to kill one another and so um, and so the first world war then along with the with the marxist revolutions and the um, and then of course the great depression followed up with the second world war and then uh, other wars that went on after that and humanity has certainly had a check put on it in terms of its being able to run its own its own uh, agenda without god um, you know, there is really cannot be a brotherhood of humanity without the fatherhood of God. And that would have to be, I believe, the greatest critique of the Enlightenment and the Romantic era. That doesn't matter which way you cut it, human beings are stained with blood guilt. Every culture in the world has blood guilt in it. And so the remedy for such a, an appalling situation has to be severe. It has to be equal to the task and therefore there was a requirement of the spilling of blood um, and if we understand this that the the ransom for the guilt of sin has to be worth it it has to be costly um, because no human being as, as psalm 49 says can ransom the life of another you've got your own problems trying to ransom your own life let alone having an excess any, anything left over to buy the life of another. No human being has what it takes to buy the life of another except Jesus Christ. He comes as the perfect human being who doesn't need to be ransomed and he offers his life as a ransom for others.
And when we talk about the grace of God, therefore, we must talk about the grace of God rooted in the cost and the, uh, and the, um, the agency of sacrifice, and in particular, the sacrifice of blood. You know, elsewhere in the Old Testament, in Exodus 23, verse 7, it says that God will by no means acquit the guilty. And so what God has done in Christ and through the sacrificial system is not just bring mere acquittal, because acquittal in the Old Testament means something like to overlook or to dismiss as irrelevant. And when God forgives, he doesn't just dismiss as irrelevant. Does he? he actually goes right into it. And he doesn't merely overlook it, rather he does something about it. He meets our injustice with the injustice of a death of an innocent. And so there is a, there is a payment that is equal to the cost. And so there is a cancelling out of sin. But the cost of cancelling out the, the appalling depth and corruption of our humanity in its brokenness must be profound and the blood of christ of course is where that cost is met that's the only thing that can satisfy the guilty and satisfy the guilty conscience it has to go deep in order to set us actually free so god's grace isn't merely saying you know don't worry about your sins it's all okay no god's grace transforms it goes deep into our souls and does something to us and for us it's not just merely dis, it's sort of a surface acquittal. It is a deep justification. So in the Old Testament, when we look at the sacrifices in the Old Testament, um, they testified to the Jews about the significance and the of the requirements of the holiness of God in order that they could live as the people of God before him and live without guilt even then. And so that's why there was always um, blood in the in the oblations of the Old Testament, even the temple itself. I mean, if we think about the temple and we think of Solomon's temple and it was one of the great, one of the great and most beautiful or one of the greatest, I should say, and one of the most beautiful buildings in the ancient world. But for all that, if you were approaching the temple in Jerusalem at its height, the first thing you would notice is not its beauty, but its stench because it was like an abattoir. And if you've ever been anywhere near an abattoir, the first thing you notice about an abattoir is not the sight of it, but the smell of it. And so there was a, um, a stench that was hanging over this beautiful building. And even, the, even the, uh, the priests who were robed in these beautiful white vestments, they, with white linen hanging around blood sacrifice, what do you think is going to happen? If you saw a priest, what you would see is a testimony to the blood of the animals that was that was uh, uh, bringing atonement for sin. So the priest was symbolically, if you like, displaying God's mercy through the sacrifice of an innocent animal in order that they would be have their sins atoned for. Now, we've got to keep in mind that the Old Testament uh, cult of worship and the blood sacrifices were actually uh, looking forward to the blood of Christ because as the writer to the Hebrews says that um, the law and the sacrifices can never even though they're repeated repeated endlessly year after year make perfect those who draw near in worship in other words the cult of, of, of blood sacrifice in the Old Testament never actually wiped out a single sin but rather it was it was looking forward to symbolically and metaphorically to the blood of Christ. And so the law required it, required that, that, that the sacrifices be made, not because the blood of animals actually wipes out the, the human sin, but because it was an act of faith saying that God will provide the lamb. You know, we could talk all about Abraham and the provision of the lamb on uh, Mount Moriah. But anyway, uh, the ultimate fulfillment of that promise to Abraham and the ultimate fulfill fulfillment of the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament was not in the blood sacrifices in the Old Testament, but looking forward to what God would do later on in the, in, in the true lamb who takes away the sin of the world, Jesus Christ. So um, uh, the sacrifices in the Old Testament are a little bit like paying the interest on a home loan but never paying anything off the principal. 
Thus the law and the sacrifices had a long view forward to the true sacrifice for sin in the body of Jesus Christ on the cross, where both the interest and the principal are paid at once. Can, can you see that? So, so Old Testament cult of worship was never paying off a single sin. It just paid off the interest, if you like. But Jesus comes and he pays the interest, he pays the, pays the principal, and he buys the house. And then he gives that house to us as a gift. But this house is not some cheap house. This is not cheap grace we're talking about here. This is expensive grace. This is costly. This is a beautiful thing. And when we understand the forgiveness of God, not merely as acquittal, and then just going back to whatever we were doing before, but as something that is profoundly costly, then it transforms. And when we, when we see it, when we experience the depth and the profundity and the extent of the redemption that Jesus Christ has paid for us, then that does something to you, not just merely as, a, as an act of gratitude or motivation, but it's transforming. And that's where we find true release, true ransom is, 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 has its effect and liberty is generated by the blood of Christ which then undergirds and is the foundation under grace. That kind of grace is the kind of grace that transform. You know, these, these days there's, there's this movement in the church called uh, hyper grace, and I believe it truly is a false teaching where, you know, it, it makes God into some kind of cosmic love bunny who would never hurt a fly. Um, but when we look at the Old Testament and when we look at the cross, what we realize is that God is a holy God. He's a holy God he loves and he loves so deeply and so and so profoundly that he does something about human sin. I remember in the book of Habakkuk, Habakkuk makes a complaint to God and he says, God, there's corruption in the city, there's corruption in, in Israel. And then he says, God, you are too holy to look on sin. And when he says you're too holy to look on sin, it doesn't mean that God is somehow squeamish and he can't handle sin because he, you know, he's always too holy to, to even look at sin. No, what, he, what Habakkuk is saying is, God, you are so pure and you are so wonderful. How can you just look at this, what's going on in Israel and do nothing about it? And the answer to Habakkuk's question in the, in the, in the ultimate isn't just the short-term things that God was doing, but the long-term thing that God was going to do about not just the sin of Israel, but the sin of all humanity is answered in the death of Jesus Christ, who pays the ransom, who redeems us like slaves from a slave market. But it isn't just with money, it's with his own life. And when that grips us, when we see that for what it is, that turns you inside out and upside down. It will change you. Because this is the only thing that satisfies the old uh, requirements and the, the, the demand of, the, of our guilty consciences. We are set free. Amen.